So I finally gave in and bought myself a thermal imaging camera, which is a handy tool to have around when working with electronics. For example, you just created a new circuit that you now want to test for the first time. Everything seems to work just fine, but after a few minutes you notice some odd behavior. And the reason is of course the missing cooling of certain components. But by using the thermal imaging camera right from the get go, you would have noticed this possibly component destroying temperature rise way faster. Or another practical example is that you got a busted smartphone that you would like to repair. After taking it apart, you of course have no idea where the problem lies. But by using the thermal imaging camera, there is a good chance you might find a hotspot in the circuits and thus a clue. Which sadly was not the case with my smartphone, since it was only drawing a little bit of power. But I think it should be clear that such a camera can be very useful. And the only reason why I hesitated to get one for this long was its price, of roughly around $530. Of course, not every maker wants to spend so much money on such a tool. Which is why in this episode of DIY or Buy, we will have a look at more budget friendly thermal imaging camera modules. And use one of them in order to create our own DIY thermal imaging camera. That only costs a fifth of the commercial one's price. And in the end we will do some comparisons between them, in order to find out whether DIYing such a tool makes sense, or whether we should stick to the commercial solution instead. Let's get started. This video is sponsored by JLC PCB which is a PCB manufacturer that I can highly recommend. And today I'm happy to announce that JLC PCB now offers aluminum boards. That means you're no longer restricted to common PCBs where thermal conductivity is more or less pretty limited. Instead, you can just order aluminum boards for thermally demanding projects, for a price of only $2. So feel free to visit JLCPCB to find out more. First off, let's talk about how such a thermal imaging camera functions. As you would expect, the eyes of the camera is obviously a camera sensor. In the case of my commercial one, it comes with a resolution of 160 by 120 pixel, so 19200 in total. Now those pixels do not react to the visible lights, which comes with a wavelength between 400 and 700 nanometer, like a normal camera would do. No, they only react to infrared lights, which comes with a wavelength of above 700 nanometer. And as some of you probably already guessed, our human eye cannot see this wavelength. But everybody emits such infrared lights. And best of all, the amount of radiation is proportional to the temperature of the body. So what sensors do in order to measure such radiation is firstly getting its pixel to a known constant temperature. Then as soon as infrared radiation hits one pixel, the energy of the radiation heats it up and thus changes its resistance, which the sensor can measure due to an increased voltage drop. This voltage drop can then be calculated back into a temperature. And thus the sensor can pretty much measure and calculate a heat map for an entire surface. And if you listen carefully, you should understand that this also works in the dark. Of course, this was only a super simplified version of the functional principle. Which actually sounds too good to be true. And yes, there is one big problem when it comes to infrared temperature measurements. As you can see, the camera measures the temperature of my hands to be around 35 degrees Celsius. But when I put on a glove that obviously comes with a different textured surface than my skin, you can see that the thermal camera now measures a slightly higher temperature of around 36 degrees Celsius. The reason is the emissivity coefficient 
which describes how much heat radiation is given off in comparison to an ideal black body, which would perfectly absorb and emit the heat radiation. Its coefficient would be 1, human skin would be around 0.97 and glossy materials would go as low as for example 0.1. You can always fine adjust this coefficient in a commercial thermal camera, but that really does not make it easier to guess this coefficient for particular objects, especially when they are reflective. That is why I would always recommend using a contact thermometer for precise temperature measurements and only a thermal imaging camera if you need to observe a big area in order to look for anomalies. And with that long theory out of the way, let's finally get to the first IR thermal camera sensor, which I actually had laying around 4 years now. This is the AMG8832, that comes with 8x8 pixel, and apparently it is nowadays obsolete, and replaced by the AMG8833, which you can get on such a lovely breakout boards. My board however is a rather big evaluation board, which I really didn't feel like transforming into a thermal camera. But just for fun I hooked it up to my computer and downloaded and opened the provided software in order to find out whether the sensor even works. And it seems like it does, but there was something wrong with the serial connection, which froze after 4 to 5 pictures. That was not a problem though, because the resolution of 64 pixel made it clear for me that I really do not want to use this sensor for a thermal camera. Or did you recognize my finger or my head in the picture? So I put this sensor board away and instead had a look at this MLX90640, which is a bit more expensive but comes with 32 by 24 pixel, so 768 in total. Unfortunately, you apparently need a degree in mathematics in order to calculate values with the sensor. But luckily Adafruit is once again here to help us with a great library. And in case you have not noticed yet, using a normal, not so powerful Arduino with the sensor will not be easily possible. Which is why instead I went with this ESP32. After connecting its I2C pins to the sensor, we can simply use the Adafruit example codes in order to output the temperature map over the serial monitor. At this point though, it was hard to see whether the sensor even works correctly. So the two things we can do to improve that is to increase the refresh rate to 4Hz, as well as using an ASCII type format for the temperatures. And I feel like now you should be able to see my head in this serial monitor data. Brilliant! So next, it was time for the real deal, by adding a small ILI9341 screen to the setup, and creating a bit of code which not only outputs the max, min and center point temperature, but also converts the measured temperature values into color differences, like a commercial thermal camera would do. And after a couple of hours, I was able to calculate some important values, but what I was able to output on the screen was pretty much just a joke. Not only do the colors not make any sense, the refresh rate is also terrible. That was the moment though I stumbled upon a project by Stoppy, which had the same goal as mine. So I reached out to him and asked whether I could use his code, and he said yes. So huge thanks to Stoppy, whose YouTube channel and website with various interesting projects you should definitely check out. But anyway, after uploading his codes, the LCD finally greeted me with a more promising looking heat map. Now in order to turn this hardware setup into a crude DIY thermal imaging camera, I designed a rudimentary enclosure, 3D printed it, mounted all of the components inside it with hot glue and screws, added my LiPo supercharger circuit with a LiPo battery to the mix for power and closed everything up. And just like that you can make your own DIY thermal imaging camera for roughly around $110. So time to put it to the test in direct comparison to my commercial camera. 
And I have to say that while Stoppy did an awesome job with the codes, this DIY camera is not really suitable for what I had in mind. The low resolution and missing picture from a real camera makes it pretty much impossible to determine the hot components on a circuit board. Also, since you cannot fine tune the emissivity coefficient, the temperature readings will be even more off than usually with a commercial thermal camera. So all in all, while such a DIY thermal imaging camera initially sounded promising, it is pretty much only useful if you want to practically explain how such a camera works. And that basically means that buy is this time the winner for me. But what do you think? Let me know in the comment section below. As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell and maybe even support me through Patreon if you enjoy my videos and want me to produce more. Stay creative and I will see you next time!